Welcome to Darshan Talks, powered by the Kulkarni Law Firm. This podcast explores the challenges and opportunities facing FDA-regulated companies. Join us as we discuss the latest trends, news, and insights with experts and executives in the field. Hey, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Darshan Talks. I'm here with George O'Brien. George is the guru of uh, rare disease states, the guru of FDA law as it relates to things like priority vouchers. He is... Uh, former uh, Hogan Lovells. Um, he has a lot of information he brings to the table, and I get to learn a lot from him. So before I continue, George, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, thanks, Darshan. It's good to be here with you. Again, George O'Brien, I'm a partner in Mayor Brown's FDA regulatory practice in Washington, D.C. As you mentioned, I spent the first 14 or so years uh, also in D.C. at Hogan Lovells doing FDA regulatory law. Great to be here today. Thank you. And George, what what do you think is the focus of your uh, practice? Yeah, broadly speaking, um, focus primarily on pharma and biotech products and their interactions throughout the regulatory process at FDA from, you know, bench to approval process and post-marketing compliance. Um, One of the areas I dive into most deeply is regulatory exclusivities for novel products. Uh, so for new chemical entities, that could be a drug or a biologic, you know, and helping companies large and small, you know, branded drug sponsors and biologic sponsors get approval, get through FDA efficiently, uh, avoid pitfalls, but if they arise, kind of overcome them and then try to maximize their, um, you know, commercial opportunity on the market with exclusivities and FDA facing patent issues. And within that, orphan drugs plays a plays a big role for a lot of sponsors, as I'm sure we'll get into. Absolutely. So, so let's sort of st- set the base for a lot of people who are unfamiliar. Uh, it's not a space I play too much in, so sure. you you are the expert in the space. Um, but let's let's talk a little bit about the strategy. So, for you, you mentioned a few different terms, and I want to explain what these what those are. The first one, the first term you mentioned is orphan. What does the term orphan disease state mean and how does that compare to a rare disease state? Yeah, so orphan is in some ways just a synonym for a rare disease. Um, The Orphan Drug Act was passed in 1983 by Congress to incentivize the development of treatments for rare diseases. And the term orphan uh, comes from this idea that sponsors were not investing in these because it was perceived not to have a commercial opportunity. So they were sort of orphaned by the the pharmaceutical industry. And I think the statistic you hear a lot is in 1983, there were something like six drugs approved for rare diseases. And um, the NORD, the National uh, Organization for Rare Disorders is a kind of umbrella patient group and a tremendous advocate for rare diseases has something like 7,000 rare diseases that they track. So from that humble beginning in 1983 with something like seven, the Orphan Drug Act was provided a kind of longer regulatory exclusivity, a seven year marketing exclusivity to incentivize the development of these drugs. And it's been a tremendous success. Um, Of the new drug approvals, for example, I think in 2022, something like 65% of them are for rare diseases. Which is interesting, right? Because to me, there are a few different things pop out of that. So the first one is the fact that um, they incentivize that. And you talk about uh, one of those incentives, which is the the seven-year marketing exclusivity, which raises the first question, what is the exclusivity? How is that different from patenting? Yeah, sure. We'll go from there. So... There's a just a little bit of the legal background without getting into the weeds too much. There's kind of a two-step process for developing uh, an orphan drug at FDA. The first is what we call orphan drug designation, and that happens during the clinical or sometimes preclinical development phase where a company submits a request to FDA to say, I would like my specific drug or biologic to be designated as an orphan drug for this particular rare disease or condition. And there's a couple of things you have to show FDA there. Number one is, is this a rare disease or condition? So there's a statutory standard. It has to affect 
fewer than 200,000 people in the United States. That's the kind of cutoff for what um, is deemed to be a rare disease. And you also have to provide evidence to FDA that there's some reason to believe your drug or biologic will be effective. That can usually be early clinical, doesn't have to be uh, you know, a big phase three study or something like that. And when you obtain that designation, FDA writes you a letter, they post it on their website, um, and that provides a number of incentives, including things like tax cuts for certain clinical trial expenses, a waiver of your app marketing application fee, which can be something like $3 million these days. And upon approval of your drug, after you've had that early designation, complete your development and clinical trials, submit to FDA. And once that product is then approved um, for an indication or a use within that disease or condition, then FDA awards this seven-year exclusivity. And in short, what it says is the agency cannot approve a competitor's application for the same drug or biologic, the same compound for the same disease. So it's a very powerful tool and different from some of the other exclusivities we think about for um, you know branded drugs prevent approval of certain generics or biologics will prevent approval of biosimilars for a certain amount of time. Orphan drug exclusivity is particularly powerful because it also blocks approval of competitor new drug applications, a competitor who does all their own studies, not just a generic, but another branded or innovator sponsors application. But for the same disease state. For the same disease, it has to be the same drug as well, or the same biologic, so the same substance. Uh, if I got, you know, orphan exclusivity for ibuprofen to treat migraine, to make up a silly example, you could come along and do acetaminophen for migraine. I don't block that because it's a different drug. Or you could do ibuprofen for, um, you know, um, hypertension, a different disease. Right. So you either have to be different drug or different disease to avoid the but now, oh, and But what about the term ibuprofen? Can it be ibu, ibuprofen hycolate versus uh, ibuprofen salicylate? Yeah, that's Would a those be considered question. to be two different ones? Yeah, for small molecule drugs, the FDA uses what they call the active moiety test. So they would ignore the salt. A different salt would still be considered the same drug. And one of the things that's really interesting to me about the Orphan Drug Act and doing this for so long is how do you fit novel products into there, biologics, gene therapies? You know, comparing two biologics is a much trickier operation than it is to compare to an ibuprofen and a salt of ibuprofen, which even with my 10th grade chemistry, I can handle, you know, relatively easily. But so that's one of the exciting things for biologics. There's a couple different rules. The agency came out with some guidance on gene therapy, for example. But one of the, I think, most exciting things, you know this from doing this so long, is how do you take these older laws and these older regulations and apply them to these cutting edge products, CAR T therapies, et cetera. And that's one of the exciting things about the job. And I think it's one of the exciting things about working at the agency probably is how do they you know, lay the groundwork for that. So, so that brings us to this question. So you talked about exclusivity being a, um, the, the, the ability that the FDA stopping others from, uh, marketing the product for the same indication for the same product. Um, you also mentioned another advantage, which was, um, the types, the, the, the tax waivers and the, uh, waiver of the marketing application fee. One of the big things you also hear about is uh, accelerated studies, and you hear about all these other tips. Do they apply in the case of orphan disease states? Yeah, what, what FDA, that's a great question, and it's a really important aspect of it. And, um, and it applies a little bit differently depending on the size of the patient population. There's a term people use sometimes called sort of ultra rare or ultra orphan. So to conduct a study where there are 400 patients in the United States is a lot different than if there's 190,000 patients in the United States. And so what FDA says is, look, our standards for approving an orphan drug are the same 
as the standards for approving a non-rare or non-orphan drug. You have to demonstrate safety and effectiveness. For, for a non-rare drug, that's typically two large phase three clinical trials, blinded, randomized, controlled clinical trials. Uh, what we have seen, and there's a great article summing this up that came out a number of years ago, is over the years, FDA applies what it calls regulatory flexibility. So it's not uncommon for rare diseases to be approved on a single trial, which is permissible under the statute for rare or non-rare, but more common for rare diseases and or and then some confirmatory evidence, perhaps a, a smaller second trial, perhaps a post-approval trial. And then lots of novel products that are orphan drugs also take advantage of other FDA programs like expedited review programs, priority review, breakthrough therapy, all have slightly different standards, but if you've got a novel orphan drug, you can also take advantage of those. So one of the other areas that's emerging, as we all know, is this area of real world evidence. And um, while the gold standard remains your two double blinded placebo controlled multi, multi center multinational studies, um, the, the FDA has expressed this willing, willingness, this interest in talking about what does reality look like and using that evidence. Has, have you seen that played out in the orphan disease state <clears throat> world? And how does that work out? Yeah, I, I think um, the short answer is playing out slowly as it is for all products, right? At, at yeah. Both sponsors and the agency are finding their way through. There's been some good guidance from FDA on real world data, real world evidence. And, you know, FDA is a, has a public health mission and as a scientific organization, they're going to evaluate data and they're going to interrogate it. So your data is only as good as your data is. And but there are things like registries. There's um, data collected from expanded access programs where the drug, which hasn't yet been approved, can sometimes be made available to patients even outside of clinical trials right sort of um either on a patient by patient basis or sometimes a smaller group um and so that data it's not a classic clinical trial but you have safety data is going to be reported from there you can have e efficacy or patient reported outcomes can play a role there it's not exactly the same thing as real world evidence but i think dovetails with it i think it's really uh, for all products, but particularly for orphan drugs, it's really going to be a, a new frontier, and we're sort of waiting to see how it goes. Talking about new frontiers, you, you talked about this idea of um, data interrogation, and everyone today is talking about things like artificial intelligence and about where that's going to take us. Uh, one of the struggles that the agency has is interpreting the data that sponsors often give to the agency um, because you have to do your own analysis. You have to figure out what this analysis means and you have to split away what the analysis means versus what the sponsor thinks it, it means. Sure. As, as you now enter this world of AI and I'm, I'm seeing these new models come out and I'm sure you are as well. Uh, are you seeing any move of using AI to help interrogate this data? And will that play a role in the case of orphan disease states? Because you can you can research and respond to sponsor, sponsor questions quicker. Yeah, I think, well, from, from the sponsor side, I think AI has become a, a valuable tool in drug development, right? Finding appropriate candidates. If you have a certain receptor that you're targeting or another molecular target, can they use AI to find, you know, the set of candidates more quickly that they could then, you know, sort of test in non-clinical and clinical trials? So that's been going on for a while and it's only going to increase. And I think um, that's sort of the easy application of it. But we've seen what we call in silico trials, right, as opposed to in vitro or in vivo. So really modeling. Um, and we've used modeling at FDA for a long time for things like pharmacokinetics, but I think there's going to be more of that. Can you do early studies in silico or you're using AI or machine learning 
to identify the best dose, you know, it's not going to replace your standard clinical trial for showing safety and efficacy. Um, whether there's ways to, you know, I think the, the challenge with any AI or machine learning application is it's only as good as the data that goes into it. So in some perfect um, world where we had access to everyone's health records, this is probably not a perfect world, but in some world where we had anonymized access to everyone's health records, I'm sure there's a lot more we could glean, but it's a challenge of getting, you know, there's no centralized system for that and it's not available to, to sponsors, obviously, or even the agency. But I think there's going to be more of that, like studying adverse events, finding things more quickly. Can they identify things? and you know solve them before they're real world problems so to speak and the other thing that's becoming really really important and that's really really hot is this idea of decentralized studies and being patient centric which theoretically are two separate ideas but mm -hmm, you can mm -hmm. see how they dovetail into each other yeah with patients with the rare disease states now it depends obviously which one of the seven thousand rare disease states we're talking about that's but right. um but the, the big question lands up being the FDA put out a guidance, I want to say yesterday or day before, I haven't had a chance to yeah. read it yet, but I don't know if you, you've had a chance to read it. But my question is, do you see decentralized studies playing a bigger role in how the industry works in general, how it's going to play in the orphan disease state more specifically? Yeah, absolutely. I think... Um... It's going to apply across the board, but absolutely for orphan drugs. And there's, you know, there's a lot of important policy reasons behind it. And, and maybe it's one of the strange legacies of COVID. That's a positive legacy of COVID for, for the public health and the, you know, industries and sponsors. But if, so I think equity, diversity and inclusion is a big part of that. So absolutely. decentralized clinical trials it's going to allow a broader geographic reach. Um, you know, many um, trials are, for obvious reasons, conducted in large cities and academic medical centers with hospitals where you have more patients. You know, you have um, the, the doctors there. But to be able to then broaden because you're using you know, apps and um, other ways of communicating over a distance, I think it's going to broaden the patient pool significantly for a lot of these trials. And when you're talking about ultra rare diseases and depending on the the state of, you know, the patient's condition, anything that's going to make it easier for a patient to join a trial to have more um, comfort and convenience, not having to go necessarily into an office as much uh, or visit um, uh, this, the clinical trial site, so to speak. I think that's going to be a win-win for everyone, patients, the agency, sponsors. Now, one of the big areas in the same space, obviously, is telemedicine. And people are talking about um, the, the legacy of COVID in that during COVID, those um, state-based restrictions were, very, were, were loosened up quite significantly. Mm -hmm. But you're seeing those barriers come right back up right now. Um, from the, while that may not may not affect someone with say diabetes as much because you have loads of providers who are all over the country who can still take care of these patients in the context of a clinical trial that's focused on rare disease state patients who may be like you said four hundred across the entire country. Um, do you see any challenges that are going to come from the the re uh, I don't know. Uh, re-regulation re of telemedicine um, than, than previously that we were looking at possibly. Yeah, I, I mentioned the organization Nord, you know, is, one of, is a great advocate and, you know, I use the term sort of umbrella of different patient groups. You know, many of these rare diseases have their own um, kind of patient group that are trying to raise awareness, get funding. You know, you think of you know, Michael J. Fox, right, you know, is one of the kind of examples in the news, but that kind of awareness raising, you know, it's a place that new patients can go to find out what, what is happening to me, what can I do, what, what can I learn from my community? 
one of the challenges that it, and what Nord does so well is put the patient voice first, right? And I think that's really important. Patient focused drug development is another initiative at FDA that's been ongoing and increasing and is critically important. And and some of that can inform like what what are the endpoints we're measuring, right? You know, is my is a patient with a chronic disease is their sort of day to day feeling better? just as important as hitting some biomarker or efficacy endpoint that we think of as a classic. And patients are saying in a lot of cases, yes, this is this is what I want, right? Yes, I would love a cure tomorrow, but in the meantime, I wanna improve my quality of life. So I think um, the patient voice is gonna be critical. And um, so, you know, going back sort of the, decentralized piece of it in telemedicine, one of the biggest challenges patients express for particularly with rare diseases is it takes a long time to get diagnosed, right? I have to go to one, two, three doctors um, to find the right diagnosis, right? My local general practitioner has perhaps heard of this, but it may present as different things. They're not expert in um, you know, whatever particular rare disease, obviously they're, they're, like I said, general practitioners finding a specialist is, you know, do you have the right specialist? Where are those specialists located? And that's where the tele telemedicine piece comes in. Can you, you know, shorten that chain to get the right diagnosis? And can we sort of, you know, all technology is great. It's sort of collapsing space and time, you know, in telemedicine, can you collapse that more quickly to get patients the treatments they need, or at least the identification or diagnosis quickly. So yeah, that's um that's something to watch. It's complicated because as you point out, it's state state by state patchwork, um, not something that FDA sort of directly regulates. But that's going to be critical for FDA regulated products. Uh, so our conversation initially started off with let's do a general discussion about rare disease states and orphan disease states. Um, and I feel like we've now just made the conversation about buzzwords in clinical research and how do they apply. So I appreciate you you going with the flow. Of course. Uh, but but here's another buzzword that's that's in play right now. And and I forget specifically what they call it because they seem to use different terms each time I talk to them. But I think it's called a credo, clinical research as a treatment option. And and that one I'm still struggling with because. On one hand, I totally get it. Uh, patients are coming in and saying, let's say I have a, um, a, I have cancer, clinical research may be one of my treatment options. On the other hand, from a pure bioethics perspective, I kind of go, the entire point of clinical research is I don't know the answer. I don't know what is going to happen. So using it as a treatment option is problematic. So I'm wondering, from someone as smart as you are, who's working in the rare disease state uh, space, where clinical research may be the only treatment option. How does that play out? Yeah, it, it has a number of different kind of implications. You know, uh, I mentioned the expanded access programs when we're talking about real world evidence. Those were created kind of just for this type of situation. And so that for one reason or another, a patient may not want to participate in the clinical trial. They may not be in the right location, uh, you know, historically. They may not meet the criteria for the clinical trial, right? Depending right. on what previous treatments they've had or other, other things, perhaps some comorbidities. And so, you know, we've had right to try legislation over the years. And, you know, FDA has made a process where Sponsors can provide that drug, you know, at cost or free to the patients where it gets challenging. And it came up in the past couple of years in a big lawsuit over orphan drug issues is what happens to those patients, for example, who are getting or even clinical trial patients, they're getting the drug for free or at cost during the development phase. And then we get approval. And this is the biggest issue facing orphan drugs going forward, as it is for many drugs, is 
we have this great incentive, which drives a lot of investment. But once you get that approval and you now have exclusivity, you've persuaded FDA, you can do this safely. It's effective. You, your manufacturing is safe. Now the price goes up, right? Because these are commercial enterprises for the most part. And there's always that balance between innovation and access. And I think it's really... Um, comes to a head for orphan drugs even more than for perhaps some non-rare diseases. So this catalyst case that was an 11th circuit case that came out, I guess, last early last year was finalized, where there were two competing sponsors developing a drug for what's called Lambert-Eaton my myasthenia syndrome, I believe, at LEMS, L-E-M-S. And the drug, it's an ultra rare, is like hundreds of patients, not even thousands, I think. So that's another example. They did clinical trials with 60 patients, but the product had been made available to patients during this expanded access, basically for free or, you know, cost for a number of years, maybe more than 10 years. And then there's kind of a horse race. One product got approved first, the price went up. And there was, you know, letters from Congress and Senator Sanders and things to FDA saying, what are we going to do about this? This is challenging for these patients, for insurers, et cetera, just the cost to the system. But you can understand the, the commercial need for the company to recoup its investments. And FDA did a kind of clever approach. The first product was approved for treatment of limbs in adults because all the clinical trial data was on adults and when the second product came along about a year later fda wouldn't approve them for adults that's the exclusivity in operation because they had the same drug but they approved the second drug for pediatric patients which is like in the tens of patients in the united states i'm probably a little bit sure. off but smaller smaller number you know by an order of magnitude and there was very little pediatric data actually in the application, either of the company's applications. So the first sponsor was frustrated by that. And I think FDA thought, well, if we get this other drug on the market, the great secret is we know it's going to be used off label, right? right? Again, you know, FDA doesn't regulate the practice of medicine or pharmacy. So a doctor can prescribe either one of those two drugs to an adult or to a pediatric patient for that matter. And the first sponsor uh, company called Catalyst sued FDA and, and ultimately prevailed um, on the basis that, and this is kind of up in the air now and it's a big issue and there's some legislation which may fix it. Um, I mentioned earlier, the designation is the first step. That you have to go for the broadest disease state so all of lens is your designation that you prove is rare etc but the approval is narrower adult lens patients and what fda has historically said is well your exclusivity only tracks your narrower approval it's not everyone with lens it's just adults and based on the wording of the statute and the court's interpretation fda's interpretation was overruled by the 11th circuit and so ultimately, Catalyst prevailed. That second drug came back off the market. And there was actually patent litigation between the two companies. So the two companies are kind of, based on licensing and the settlement of the patent, after all of FDA's efforts, perhaps, like I said, too clever by half to get two products on the market, the agency now lost the case that's made it confusing for everybody else about what the scope of warfarin exclusivity is. And there's only one product approved for LEMS now. So it's been a real challenge over the last 18 months how to advise sponsors and, and give them the, you know, the right thing. I think FDA's policy is sensible, right? You should get exclusivity for what you studied, you know, whether it's consistent with the statute or not, you know, we defer to the courts on that. But what we're seeing is FDA has tried to essentially get a legislative fix in the user fee reauthorizations at the end of last year. But as you may remember, all of those extra laws in riders and attachments were taken off and it was passed as a clean user fee reauthorization. And that 
is a thing called the rare act is kind of percolating still but what remains to be seen and i think you know it's always going to be a challenge between innovation and incentives and access and pricing but where we're at right now is this uncertainty which is bad for everybody right it's bad for branded companies it's bad for generic companies it's bad for patients you know and it's confusing for fda too so hopefully that will get resolved and i think as i mentioned i think fda's policy makes sense and maybe the statute will be fixed to to allow them to do that george this this was amazing i have several more questions that i had ready but we've run out of time yeah but well, before we so go absolutely before we go how can people reach you yeah, so I'm I'm at Mayor Brown, you know, George O'Brien, uh, FDA regulatory practice. You can find my email. You can find me on LinkedIn as well. And, um, you know, happy to help. And one of the great things about Orphan Drug is you get to help the biggest pharma companies in the world and you get to help the smallest companies in the world who've got a product and an idea and are trying to help patients with rare diseases. So it's really fun. Awesome. Well, George, thank you again for coming on. This was wonderful. Thank you, Darshan. Thank you for listening to this episode of Darshan Talks. Remember, the information we discuss is for educational purposes only and is not legal advice. For additional valuable insights and updates, be sure to subscribe to our newsletter at darshantalks.com. Darshan Talks is powered by the Kulkarni Law Firm.